Hello and welcome everyone to How to Manage Food Urges and Cravings. My name is Estelle Coombe-Heath or Stell as my friends call me and I'm excited today to um, share with you you know some of the things that I've learned over the years um, through helping clients through my own journey and um, also just um, how to start getting to the bottom of our food urges and cravings. So basically, I thought what we'll do as we um, start here, let's just reflect a little bit and let me know what you normally crave. Is it sweet, salty? If you um, feel like you're more of a carb person or chocolate, post in the comments um, and I'll pick those up in the chat. So pop that in the chat box. What is your biggest cravings. If you're watching this on the replay, pop it in the comments wherever you see this. As I wait for those, Tammy says carbs. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> and that's the thing, you know, like we, um, our bodies will often send us messages about cravings and um, it just means we need to start working with, with what we crave. So carbs is usually a sign of craving um, some comfort. And, um, you know, we are able to work with, work with that when we know what our bodies need. Beautiful. So just going to give you a little bit of a breakdown of how today's going to work so that you know just what to expect. So basically, um, I want to make sure that you guys kind of get the most out of the session. So make sure that you've switched off any, um, any distractions. So if you possibly could put in your phone on flight mode um, or just turning it upside down often just helps to minimize the distractions. If you can't see the little flickers of the lights of your phone, um, if you have pen and paper, grab that because that's going to be super helpful. And what we'll do is we'll just cover a little bit about me. Uh, we'll talk about why you crave, um, have cravings and urges and, you know, just um, busting one or two myths around that. And then we'll learn three of my tips or tweaks that I actually teach my clients on how to manage your cravings and urges. And this will help you in the end to start beach, uh, beating the binge for good. And then I have a special announcement towards the end where um, it's a new resource that I'm super excited about announcing and you guys will be the first to know about it. So um, that will come towards the end. So let's get going into this webinar so that I can keep on track with time. I like to chat sometimes. <laughs> I need to always just make sure that I just um, stick to the point. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am a, as you can see in the picture there, I am a dog mom. Um, I've had Kaiser, we've had Kaiser for um, just over seven years. He's our baby. As you can see, he just like takes over the, the, the furniture. I'm also a yoga teacher. I've been teaching for just over two and a half years now. It's something that I'm super passionate about. And, um, you know, I infuse a lot what I've learned in my yoga teachings. Um, it might not be the physical a movement, but you know, I teach a lot of what I've learned through that, um, through my teachings, in um, you know, in what I you know talk about because that's something that's really helped me um, in my recovery is that mindfulness that I achieved through yoga. So, as you can see on the right, I'm a little bit of um, a love adventure. So getting out there, climbing walls, jumping off cliffs is kind of my thing. I also love the outdoors. Um, hubby and I, we've been married for just over 12 years now, and we just love the outdoors. This was taken on, this photo was taken just this weekend when we went camping um, by the beach. We were finally allowed back out after lockdown. 
And most lastly, I have been binge free now for close to three years. It's coming up to a three year anniversary in November. And um, I'm just really passionate about teaching what I've learned. And I've just realized I'm wearing the exact same outfit as I am wearing in this picture. It's because it's one of my most colorful outfits. I love the colors and it really just helps um, bring in, you know, some light in me. The color yellow just works so well. And this picture just um, symbolizes me enjoying um, enjoying life in a balanced kind of way. So in front of there, there's a little bit of a cocktail and then I'm eating a bit of halloumi guilt-free. So, and that's what I'm passionate about teaching. I love just showing um, women what life can be like when we achieve that balance. And balance is one of the pillars that I teach in my programs. So just a little bit about you know, what some people have said about working with me. Um, uh, w. Woods said, Estelle is amazing, supportive and honest. She's helped me take control back with regards to emotional eating. And with her guidance and support, I was able to realize that I can trust myself around food and make healthy choices. And that is just such a big one. Finding that trust is absolutely pertinent. And we build that trust slowly as, as we work together. Next, Renee um, said, working with Estelle has been a breath of fresh air. She has, uh, she's different than any other counselor, health coach or therapist I've worked with in the past. She has taught me great techniques on managing anxiety. She provides many tools and resources that have always been available at your fingertips. I look forward to our sessions every week because it is a judgment-free, comforting space. So I just wanted to give you a couple just of, you know, how I've helped some of these women and how I help women, um, you know, just break out of um, you being a slave to urges and cravings. So I'd love for you to just ponder for a moment. What is your biggest struggle with urges and cravings? So if you uh, want to pop that into the comment box, you are welcome. If you are watching this uh, on the replay, there will be a comment box there for you as well. Pop it in the link and just allow, um, just reflect a little bit about what those struggles are. And, you know, I think we, we kind of trip up by thinking there's something wrong with us because we have these urges and cravings. Um, but when we actually just even inquire about it and we bring that awareness to ourselves, we are able to um, just help ourselves be um, more aware of what's going on for us. Great. So once you've got that, I'll just pop into the chat to see if anyone's popped anything there. Awesome. Amazing. So why, uh, why do we have cravings? Where does it come from really? Like why do we end up at 3 p.m. in the afternoon struggling to understand, you know, or just have those mo pivotal moments of like, you know, that drive to just walk to the vending machine and get something or um, the, you know, late night binge attack where you just need to get that beautiful massive tub of ice cream out of the freezer. Why is that? You know, why do we have these cravings and where do they come from? So a craving, the way I see cravings is when our bodies function the way it is and we um, nurture it and nourish it the way it's meant to be nourished and not just food wise um, i'm talking water i'm talking mentally i'm talking physically then the body functions opti optimally but if we for some or other reason 
And this could be anything. It couldn't. It could possibly not be even be your fault. If we feel stressed, for example, if we haven't moved our bodies, for example, if the body feels under any form of stress, we will experience cravings in the body. So cravings are natural, they're not the enemy. And what I always say to my clients is that they are a signal that something is out of balance in the body. And that is great information. The more we can see our cravings as information and use that, the better. So why do we have cravings and where do they come from? And what are some possible causes of cravings? So we'll talk about the visual cues first. Often when we are hungry and we drive past McDonald's, we're going to see that beautiful burger that they've got advertised. It looks absolutely delicious. And we visually see that and all of a sudden, all we can think about is food the rest of the time so there is something to be said about seeing things visually but usually that is the visual is not really the cause it's more just the um the driving factor that's kind of um accentuated the underlying roots and the underlying root, for example like i mentioned is probably hunger next we have um, food. So if we eat certain foods or we don't eat certain foods and we um, or we eat certain foods that are not going to nourish us in the way that our bodies need. So for example, if you just ate an apple all day, you will definitely experience cravings towards lunchtime. You know, there's a lot of people taking crazy diets out there, you know, just a water fast for seven days um, you know, you know, the cayenne pepper, lemon um, juice diet, you know, all those kind of things um, deprives our bodies of nutrients and our bodies need nutrients and calories to function. You know, calories have been uh, kind of made out as being the enemy. However, we need calories to, to make our body function. And if we um, don't eat at certain times or we don't eat enough, our bodies will send out signals and crave for cravings. And it's usually the high energy foods that we would crave, like our sugars and carbohydrates, because the body knows that that's going to give it energy, the most energy, the most bang for the buck, for buck, uh, as we call it. The next thing is your emotions. So, you know, there's a lot to be said about emotions you know, and having emotional cravings for certain foods. And this comes from either trying to distract yourself from a certain a negative emotion, or there's an emotional association to certain foods. So for example, if you have always eaten a black velvet cupcake with your friend, um, you know, um, during lunchtime, for example, you will start getting an emotional attachment to black velvet cupcakes. And the emotion there is more that sense of belonging and friendship. And when you um, think of uh, friends or friendship, or you feel lonely, you might possibly start wanting that uh, beautiful black velvet cupcake. Um, we also have hormonal causes of um, you know, cravings. And this is our whole body is made up of hormones. So this is not just our um, feminine reproductive hormones. Yes, they play a role in us craving um, foods, especially, you know, estrogen levels. Um, when that's higher, that's just um, our bodies need a little bit more energy. And that's why we might crave that chocolate. Um, we also feel a lot more emotional during hormonal phases of our cycle. And, you know, chocolate is, um, you know, one of the things that really kind of soothes our, um, our heart emotions, if that makes sense. So it kind of makes us feel loved. And that's often why we crave chocolates um, close to um, that time of the month. Then we have environmental toxins in the air, you know, so we, we think about toxins just being in certain cleaning products, 
but you know there's unfortunately toxins everywhere we go so we breathe it in our furniture emits uh, toxins and unfortunately our body needs to work hard to get rid of those toxins and it's um when the body needs to work hard to get rid of the toxins again it needs more energy and that's where we we could possibly end up craving things next is the um the force of habit so our um you know it could be again i'll use the 3 p.m example where at 3 p.m in the afternoon you basically always go to the vending machine and eventually the body kind of gets used to that. Um, you know, it could be that there's a, a break from your desk. It, uh, it's a small little walk. So the body gets movement. So there's a lot of physical benefits to just getting up from your desk and going um, to the vending machine. The body kind of puts all that together. And uh, all of a sudden, every day at 3 p.m., you kind of feel that um, craving coming on. The habit of sitting all day can also create cravings because the body is, you know, the body likes to move. If the body doesn't move, the muscles and, you know, connective tissue starts to atrophy um, because it's not being used. And often because the, the body doesn't want to do that, it's craving that movement and um, that craving cannot be communicated to us in any other way than, hey, get up and go and get a snack. <laughs> <laughs> and then next we have our brain and the brain is pretty much the thing that governs everything that goes on in the body it generates uh, it's in charge of generating most of our hormones in um, that works with the metabolism and um, it will monitor all the time uh, for imbalances in the body. If it feels like we have an imbalance, um, we will crave things, something. So if we have, for example, a imbalance in our hunger hormones, uh, ghrelin, we will start generating neuropeptide Y, which creates cravings for carbohydrates and sugar. So the, our brain keeps thinking about, um, you know, it continuously tries to make us um, you know, op uh, like function at our optimal, but also its main function is to keep us alive. So if you on purpose, you know, um, if you purposely um, holding back on certain foods, if you're not eating enough during the day, for whatever reason, if you're not drinking water during the day, you will probably find yourself craving salty foods. Um, so the brain has a very good reason to send cravings to us because it's trying to maintain a homeostasis. And that's when I always talk about uh, cravings being a sign that something is out of, out of equilibrium or out of balance. And we can start using that to the best of our abilities. Beautiful. So what actually drives you to keep giving in to cravings? Now, you know, this is something that I never understood. I thought I would just fight and fight the cravings and then eventually they will go away. And, you know, that works in the short term. However, somewhere down the line, I would self-sabotage my eating plan or my latest diet because I thought I managed the cravings by ignoring them. However, somewhere down the line, I would find myself eating um, a whole box of pastries on my way home from work. So the, there's this undeniable, deniable, if we start ignoring our cravings, we, um, the body keeps going and, and saying, it's time to eat, it's time to eat, it's time to eat. And uh, this can come along um, through different reasons. And the, the part of the brain that's in charge of the urge to eat is our hypothalamus. And this is the part of bra the brain that's in charge of the um, uh, pretty much all our functions. So whether it's sleep patterns, whether it's just digestion, 
um, everything kind of happens in the hypothalamus. It's one of those, the primal parts of the brain. You can't really see it much in this picture. It's kind of behind this um, orange lobe. However, I really enjoyed this picture that um, the Love Light Inspiration magazine uh, created um, in one of the articles that I wrote. So the, um, the hypothalamus regulates pretty much everything that happens in the body. And it comes from that very old part of the brain. So people often call this the lizard brain or the, you know, the monkey mind, um, the primal brain. And, you know, my clients and I, we've started naming this the food zombie brain because that's the part of the brain that sometimes just switches off your mind and sends you into a feeding frenzy without you able, being able to stop. So this part of our brain is what creates the urge to eat and it will um you know when i work with my clients often we we don't understand what that urge is you know we can conceptually get it like there's an urge however when i start working with my clients i actually help them feel what that feels like in the body what kind of signals come up for them um because it can be in different forms it can be in forms of thoughts it can be in forms of feelings in the body, and it can also be in form of tastes or sensations, especially in the mouth or the throat area. So if you are able to start identifying when that urge comes up, you are able to then go, ah, okay, my body is telling me there's an urge, or I've recognized now that there's an urge. Let me react to that instead of, you know, just ignoring what's going on. So the urge creates a couple of, you know, ways of how we react um, during, um, our, you know, throughout our behavior with food. And I've named these um, the typical ways, uh, the food zombie squad, because our brain has different ways of getting us to give in to those urges and cravings. And the first one is called wagon wonder. Wagon Wanda is my self-saboteur. She's really good at, you know, um, starting a diet, but then finds herself um, fighting and being the victim of self-sabotage all the time. And, you know, Wagon Wanda is something that we often um, can identify with because I think, you know, if, if you are here, you have attempted a couple of eating plans and most of them you have found yourself in self-sabotage. And Wagon Wanda often says to you, whispers in your mind, well, you know, you've already had one. You might as well have some more finishes so that we can start again on Monday. Next, we have Counting Cassie. And Cassie is um, the part of the, um, our bodies and our subconscious that wants to be, that obsesses about eating healthy. And unfortunately, when we want to just eat healthy and pure and cut out everything um, in our diets, that's not, um, that's calorie free, dairy free, uh, sugar free, all those kind of things, that creates a lot of deprivation in the body, you know, because the body needs um, ca calories to function if we keep cutting and cutting calories that's often going to lead us into um, binge eating and this is something that I struggled with for many many years is I was counting Cassie uh, I was all these <laughs> um, sometimes all at once sometimes just one at a time however you know I was counting Cassie um, a lot um, towards the end of 2018 where I wanted to just be perfect and eating perfect and I thought that would manage my um, binge eating however it just made it absolutely worse so it's um, you know really about finding balance but also starting to um, recognize when you are trying to be so 100% and 100% perfect on your diet and perfect in your eating and if we are cutting out all these foods, that's usually the foods that we crave. 
because uh, like I said, there's an emotional attachment that we've sometimes created around those certain foods. There's habitual um, reasons why we crave foods. And if we ignore that and we don't manage the way we are around food, that's just going to lead to a binge um, later on. Then Recovery Roxy is what I call my clients, uh, those who have kind of been through the process with me. Um, she pretty much understands her cravings without having to eat. We're never not going to have cravings, but when we actually get those cravings and we're able to recognize, oh, I'm having a craving and, and approach that with curiosity and say to yourself, well, what is out of balance? You know, that's when we are able to um, go through life, nourish ourselves without eating sometimes. And sometimes that craving is valid. You know, sometimes it's like, oh, I'm craving lunch. It's time to eat, you know, and that's perfectly fine. Not like, oh my gosh, I'm craving foods again. Um, I'm going to wait another two hours before I eat my food. <laughs> um, so, you know, knowing how to nourish yourself when you're emotional is also really important. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in one of the steps that I teach my clients. And also being able to mindfully indulge in food um, and being able to still have that balance. You know, no one wants to be on diet for the rest of their lives. I mean, that just really sucks. I don't want to see any of my clients sticking to the celery soup diet until they pass away. <laughs> Like, no, that's not what life is about. It's about finding that absolute balance. Next, we have Anxious Annie. And Anxious Annie is that stress eater. So everything goes well for her. But the minute she uh, gets anxious, she wants to eat. Now, Anxious Annie also gets anxious about food. And she feels like her anxiety levels kind of creep up when the minute she walks past um, the chocolate aisle or the bakery aisle and she's got these um, battles in her head about whether to get the pastry or not get the pastry and okay, maybe just, just get one pastry, I'll, I'll save it for later. And the next minute she's got like 10 other things in, in her trolley as well because she's opened up the door to one thing. So she gets really anxious when she goes out to the supermarket or when she goes out to lunch with her friends because she can't trust herself around the, the food she's got and her surroundings when it comes to food. And unfortunately, that anxiety can also drive you to overeat. So I was anxious, Annie, for many years. Um, and, you know, it, it was, um, I didn't actually realize I was anxious, Annie. I just thought I couldn't control myself around food, but I never put two and two together that my binges were often tied out down to stressful situations in my life. And we have, um, next we have late night Lizzie and Lizzie does well during the day, but she usually falls back off track when it comes to the evening time. And this can sometimes start at 3 p.m. in the afternoon or it's when she gets home from work. She just has her dinner and um, kind of goes crazy after dinner time. And, you know, late night Lizzie can get quite frustrating um, because a lot of people feel like they, you know, they've eaten enough, they're not hungry, um, and they just can't understand why they keep going um, food-wise or why they still need to have that sweetness in their lives, you know, after, after dinner. So again, that sweetness or that craving to overeat after dinner is again signaling something that's amiss. And often what I find in this situation is that late night eating is to do with us not processing the emotions throughout the day. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Next is P Possessed Patsy. <laughs> and um, Possessed Patsy is those food thoughts that you get all the time. So the food zombie brain sends you those thoughts all the time about food. If you've been, um, if you've been triggered in any way, uh, you will hear possessed Patsy in your mind the whole time. Let's just get one. Let's just, I don't have time to cook anything today. Um, or 
uh, what used to happen with me is in the mornings, I would wake up. The first thing I would think about is how am I going to eat better today so that I can lose weight tomorrow? And that thought would fuel my thinking the rest of the day. Every time if I was thinking about um, how I can eat better when I was eating my breakfast and I was thinking about um, how I can, you know, eat um, how I'm not going to eat my afternoon snack because I'm going out for dinner and I want a glass of wine. And then when I'm eating um, out for dinner and I'm having that glass of wine, I'm thinking about whether I should have the dessert or not. And whether if I have the dessert, if I can go run an extra five kilometers tomorrow to just burn that all off. And then at nighttime, I'll go to bed feeling guilty about that dessert that I've eaten and thinking about how tomorrow I need to wake up a little bit earlier so that I can add in a couple of, um, you know, a high intensity interval training before I go, um, go to work. And, and, you know, it just carries on and on and on in your mind. So I'm just going to let you reflect for a little bit and find out which one are you, which one of the food zombies resonates with you the most. Now this could be, um, you could be relate to just one of them or you could relate to all of them, or sometimes maybe they pop up for you in different times of the day. So pop that into the chat box, pop that into the comments if you're watching this later on. Let me know, which one do you resonate with the most? Beautiful. I can't wait to see all the comments. <laughs> Tammy says all of them. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I've created these little characters just because people can relate to that and people can kind of understand that that's just certain ways of how our urges present themselves. So let's move on to the next part. So, you know, um, I just popped up this um, little blurb from one of my clients, Jamie, where, she, you know, she just basically really struggled with getting her eating under control. She did one of my challenges and really started seeing a difference. And then she decided to work with me in a one-on-one -on -one capacity and she really started learning about her habits around food, her hangups, and, you know, realizing that she was getting in her own way. She was ignoring what the, you know, what the food zombie or those cravings were telling her. And in that, you know, she was able to, um, you know, through working with me, she was able to start really um, finding out who she was as a person, she started getting self-confidence back because she no longer gave in to those urges and cravings. And, you know, with, with Jamie, those urges and cravings, like most of my clients, they get smaller and smaller and smaller if we deal with them, if we identify them and we know how to manage them. And that's what we'll be talking about soon. And just another one, Marianne said that, you know, my advice to her about stopping the diet cycle made such a difference to her. Her cravings became better. She's now listening to her body and food is no longer the enemy, um, you know, and this is all because she stopped listening to that food zombie brain. And she now listens to the brain that tells her what she needs. And you know, that is just such a beautiful place to be in. So I'm always grateful to just share these little stories with you because I want you to realize that these um, recovery from all of this is possible. And sometimes we just need to be guided slightly in the right direction. So, you know, um, th there is definitely hope. It's not just me that's recovered other people have done it as well and 
if they can, then you can. And I have full faith that, you know, someday you and I will be chatting about your recovery and what a massive difference it's made in your life. So getting into my top three tips or tweaks to manage cravings and urges. However, if you had a question um, just on the cravings and the urges part, um, then let me know in the comments or the chat. And before I get started in the next section. section. It's getting so hot here and I'm just needing a lot of water <laughs> during the day. <laughs> so in order for us to start managing cravings and emotions, we need to dig a little bit deeper. And this is usually the one of the pillars that I teach my um, in, in my programs is the, the um, step of managing emotions and all forms of triggers. So one of the things we need to do to start healing, especially in an emotional space, is healing emotional wounds and we can only do that if we start um, prioritizing self-care and self-compassion in ourselves uh, emotional healing takes a lot of energy and often my client you know often people don't even realize that emotional wounds is such a big driver when it comes to eating so very recently one of my clients realized that she is actually triggered some like um, an old emotional wound is triggered every single time someone oversteps her boundaries. And what that means for her is she goes back to somewhere back deep into her subconscious back when she was a little girl. And um, that wound gets scraped open every time that boundary is crossed now, even in this uh, time. And that makes her extremely angry. And when she's angry, she doesn't like being angry because angry is not in her nature. It feels uncomfortable. And that's what's been driving her to binge eat. So paying attention to your physical sensations of cravings is... Um, so important also understanding what your body needs and one of the questions i ask my clients very very often is what does your body need and then taking the extra time to really listen and take care of yourself you know if you had to start asking your body what what do i need it definitely is going to start giving you some answers the other thing about um, emotions is if it's a deep emotion that we feel uh, and this could be just anxiety just throughout the day it could be you know a certain trauma that's tied to anxiety if we don't deal with those traumas throughout the day we are not going to be able to um, feel comfortable in our bodies and towards the end of the day our body's tired the brain's tired and now we're sitting with this old emotional um, wound or this emotion of anxiety that we've been carrying with us all day and that is what you know triggers a lot of overeating especially at night time is not dealing with your emotions and your um, other triggers during the day so you know and while we're talking about triggers here, the tr most main triggers of urges is hunger is the number one uh, trigger. Then we have emotions and then we have habit. So if we're not aware about our, how we feel in our bodies, with whether our bodies are fueled, if we're not aware of the emotions we are experiencing or we've ignored our emotions, that's often just going to lead to us giving in at the end of the day when we're tired and we've just had so many things going on. And then if we're not aware of the habits we've created around these two things, around hunger and emotion, 
then we will always be triggered throughout the day and we'll always feel like we out of control around food next is managing anxiety around food now this is such a big one because i always talk about anxiety being a double-edged sword you can have anxiety that triggers you and that leads you into eating or you get so anxious about food that that eventually leads you into eating anyway so how do we start managing anxiety around food we need to stop fearing the foods we need to bring in a more of a kindness to ourselves when we eat and bringing in balance when we eat so if you're restricting if you um, are you know blaming food and saying how toxic it is how sugar is so addictive you create a fear in your body you create a fear in your mind so every time you walk past that chocolate aisle you are going to feel anxious and our bodies don't like feeling anxiety it's one of the lowest vibrational emotional emotions it's uncomfortable and our bodies are soon going to reach for some form of distraction or comfort and food is one of the things that will provide that for us so if you're able to start relieving and you know bringing more of a neutral um, way of looking at food that's going to help you a lot to reduce some of that fears um, in food and also if you start managing some of your stress levels you will start lowering those cravings and then you'll start reducing that stress eating that happens so so often and then the last step is to nourish your mind and body without food. Now, this is probably one of the hardest things that um, I work with um, on myself. And um, that, you know, like I took forever to start finding things to nourish my body or nourish myself without, you know, looking for food because I had this habit of always treating myself with food of always you know going out for dinner or buying myself a bottle of wine or you know um getting a piece of cake um when i've i'm trying to celebrate something so when i needed to find different ways of nourishing my mind and body i had no idea i had no clue what to look for so some of the things that will really start nourishing that mind and body the first one is making peace with food because if you have that more neutral aspect around food you'll start following your intuition of what your body needs and what serves your body well when it comes to food but you'll also start noticing when your cravings are not food related when it is actually an emotional craving so and we can't really see that if we're in that very you know restrictive controlling way around food it's it's not something that we can clearly see and i was in denial about this for many years you know i just figured well i just cannot eat sugar it's just you know once i start i just can't stop and I, real, I didn't realize how that was triggering anxieties in my body and mind. And just by relieving that anxiety around sugar and being okay with I have a little, if I have a little bit of sugar, you know, it's not like I have it all the time, but just being okay with that. And when I do have it, like, you know, having the permission to do so, already I released the anxiety around the sugar and already my mind was nourished by just not working getting myself into a frenzy the next thing is you know in order for us to start nourishing ourselves we need to make friends with our bodies because otherwise how are you going to know what your body likes how are you going to know what your body needs if you are completely at war with your body all the time so if you 
you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying that you need to all of a sudden love your body, you know, as it is. But what we can do is start um, accepting your body, you know, and when we accept our body, we become more mindful um, to when we have these cravings or to when something's out of line. And that's when we're able to react and nourish ourselves without, without food. And then the last one um, in the nourishment side is planning for success. Now, you might be wondering, well, how's that nourishing to my mind and body? But, you know, if you manage your day and week um, as much as possible, you are avoiding the extra stresses you add onto your body. If you are planning what you eat during the week, you are avoiding certain cravings because if you know your body you know how to nourish it and you plan on what to eat for the week and you eat mostly what's in your plan your body will be nourished and you won't have those cravings so planning is actually such a nourishing thing for us to do you know we often think nourishment is just a, like the picture there a bubble bath or meditation in the himalayas and everything else but often it is taking those things that will take our make um, take some of the anxieties out of our day and really just help us feel and manage ourselves better. So that was pretty much my three steps, and um, I'm ready for some questions. If you have any, you're welcome to type them into the chat box. Um, and while you're doing that, I will be just revealing the um the little tool that i mentioned um that i will be releasing to you guys so i've been working with um or working on something super amazing it's been pretty much a dream of mine for over two years and it has finally just come um into reality and you know um it's it's been a great experience to do this and um, what i have for you today is an amazing new resource that's free to you to use and it's something that you can switch on in your car or you can switch on on your way home and you can listen to some advice you can listen to some of um my meditations that I'll be sharing just and most of the things that um, I have been working on when I'm um, working on throughout the years I'll be adding into here because it's going to be just just a platform for you to gain more of this knowledge and just empower yourself a lot more um, when it comes to overeating and um, that is um, yeah, I'm super excited about this. This is the Beyond Overeating podcast. And I see my wording is not showing in the presentation, but I have just released a brand new podcast that will help you address all these things, little bite-sized pieces of information to keep you going, stories about my recovery, stories about other people's recovery so um what i'll do is i'll pop the link to that in the chat and if you are watching this in the replay you will receive um, the link for that as well so that's basically um what i wanted to share with you today and um what i might do is just stop the recording so thank you everyone for watching um, and then i'll just answer any more questions if anyone has anything in um, for those who've attended live